Cabernet tends to be the sort of Errol Flynn of the great varieties. One of Australia's leading beer judges. People always ask, how do you get involved in sake and how does that connect to music? Because wine is an adventure. Conventional winemakers who just condemn all natural wine as faulty. The prestigious title of sake samurai. Looking at whiskey in more of an artful culinary way. The difference between getting good quality fresh hops, it just translates straight through into the beer. This is the Drinks Adventures podcast. I'm James Atkinson and this is the show where I speak to some of the world's most exciting producers of beer, wine and spirits and uncover trends and issues in the drinks industry today. The Chinese wine industry has made global headlines in 2020 as the Australian wine industry grapples with the impact of a new tariff on its biggest export market. The news got me thinking about how little I know about domestic wine production in China, so I decided to consult an expert. Emily Steckenborn is host and creator of the Bottled in China podcast, which she founded in 2016 to share the stories and adventures of passionate individuals in the Asian food and beverage scene. Emily has lived in Shanghai for more than nine years. She previously worked at Summergate Fine Wines and Spirits, the Chinese importer founded by Ian Ford, with whom we discuss the China drinks industry more broadly in Season 5 of the Drinks Adventures podcast. Emily oversees wine programs for top-tier businesses in Asia, including serving as the wine consultant for China Eastern Airlines. And she's also very knowledgeable about Chinese wine and the culture of wine appreciation in China. Emily joins us to share this knowledge and also tell us a bit more about Bottled in China. The show is already on my regular rotation, and in fact, I'll be making an appearance in the coming weeks. So be sure to tune in and subscribe to Bottled in China wherever you listen to podcasts. First up in this episode, I asked Emily how she found her way from Canada to work in the wine industry in China. What I love about Australian craft spirits is that our distillers are truly free to experiment. We aren't governed by rules and traditions. That's why the flavour and character of Australian spirits is so unique. But it takes distilling prowess and another critical ingredient to bring these products to market. And that ingredient is Bintani. Bintani supplies distillers with malts of all colours, flavours and aromas. They have a leading range of yeast and other ingredients and the professional expertise to help distillers create the spirits of their dreams. Make Bintani your partner in taste and quality. Right, so I've been in China for about nine years now, and definitely it wasn't my vision to be here for that long. But what ended up happening is after going to school in wine um, back in Canada, I had an opportunity to come out to China, and what turned from two years became nine years. And I think a lot of people in China will tell you that as well, or living abroad. And, you know, it's been fascinating because you know, the Chinese wine market when I first arrived was really just beginning and people were only drinking Bordeaux and it was a very segmented market. It, you know, a lot of fake wines as well. But today it's completely different. It's quite a a fast moving market. And so I've really been able to witness the change and see how quickly it all comes together. And yet it's just everyday changes. So I think that's what keeps me in China is really the diversity, the pace of China, And then also, you know, it was really lagging. I think you would agree 10 years ago, it was really lagging in terms of wine knowledge. But today, it's unbelievable. In the last three years, we've had five masters of wine in China. So that just tells you how quickly things are changing um, here in the industry. Had you studied Chinese language before you left Canada? Not so much. I mean, I did have a tutor growing up, but that was something that I think like anybody who learns a language, you can study it for years. And until you go to the country, you can't really speak, right? So it's definitely when I arrived to China. And then because work was so busy, I never picked it up again. But now, you know, all of our presentations are in Chinese. You know, if you want to do business in China, you need to speak Chinese. So I'm glad that I was able to absorb that as I was working. And just given the amount of time being in the country, I think it it all kind of came together. Now, I think Australians and people in lots of other countries as well would be aware that there is a Chinese wine industry, but we really don't know anything about it. How long has wine been produced in China And where are the key regions and and what sort of styles of wine are being produced? Right, well, that's actually quite interesting because, 
You know, wine in China, if you look at fermented fruits, that's been around for a very long time. In fact, a lot of people are saying that traces back, you know, almost the same time when wine was being made thousands of years ago. But in terms of the actual commercial aspect of wine production, that wasn't really until the 1980s. So first, the industry is super young. And anybody, you know, Australia is famous for wine. Anybody who has a winery or works in the vineyard knows that wine is not made overnight, right, James? It takes a long time. So to think that the industry started around the 1980s, it still is not at the peak of quality just yet. Some producers are really, you know, have potential. They definitely are making good quality wine. But, we're, you know, we're going to be able to see the development of the wine industry for another few years. And what I would say is the main regions kind of reflect that dynamic growth of the Chinese, you know, local and domestic wine production. It started off in Shandong. Shandong, um, actually, you're a beer guy, James. Have you ever heard of Qingdao beer? Of course I have, yes. Okay, right. (laughs) I think it's sometimes I've seen it at Chinese restaurants in Sydney. So I feel like it's kind of exported a little bit. But Qingdao beer is in the province of Shandong. And that area was first really the key production area of China. It still is. 40% of wine production is still in Shandong province. But the problem is that's a very almost maritime climate a lot of water, a lot of problems with disease pressure. So the thing is, is that area, although it started for production, that is not today what I would qualify as our premium wine region. So that's one of the issues I see with China and why I don't think the current export out of China has been so successful. First, a very young country in terms of wine production, but most importantly, where it started off, people have a really bad experience with Chinese wines. I'm sure you've heard of it. Friends or guests said they came to China five, 10 years ago, they tried Chinese wine and they're never going to try it again. But I would invite them to try it again now because the industry is evolving. So Shandong is the key region. That's right alongside the water. It's a little bit kind of north in a sense. And today, the two other premium regions I just want to introduce to your listeners is really more in terms of Ningxia. And then you have another one called Yunnan. So, you know, have you heard of those other two regions, James? I don't think so, no. And many people haven't. So it's all new. And even people in China don't even know this. These are a lot smaller. They're more up and coming. But those are more of the quality regions in terms of good quality wine. Shandong still remains as the volume, as I mentioned. And I'm sure you've seen pictures when they talk about Chinese wines, those big chateaus that are replicas of Bordeaux, right? And um, if you go, it really does look like that. You have hundreds of these fake, huge mansions lined up um, replicating Bordeaux's best estates. And uh, they're definitely there as a beauty and picturesque scene, but they're not there to make great quality wine because it's very difficult. But Ningxia has a lot of potential. This area is more, more isolated, so really continental climate. But the problem here is all about vine burial. So if you've heard of that, is you literally have to bury the vines in winter because it freezes. And so the work that is needed to make wine in that region is not only expensive, it's very difficult to make wine. And one region I'm excited about, I don't know if you guys have had Yunnan food before, but Yunnan is a province that borders Tibet, Laos, Vietnam. So, you know, it's it's kind of west in China, southwestern area. That's actually an up-and-coming region, and that's really fascinating because it borders Tibet. So here, altitude is really key. What are the key varieties in Chinese wine? Right. So, you know, something interesting is you would think that when you have altitude, let's say Yunnan, that white wine would be best. Or if you have a rainy climate, maybe, you know, a thicker skin white wine or a different varietal. But In China, a lot of these productions were really based on commercial reasoning, right? So cab is king in China, Cabernet Sauvignon, and that's still what we see as kind of the main driver for quality wine here. You know, in China, a large percentage of wine consumed is red, dry red wine. So that's the key kind of varietal here. And then you have some other ones, Marcelin and Cabernet Grenache. So Cabernet Grenache actually turns out is Carmenere. 
So, you know, again, you'd think, why is that there? And that was brought in a long time ago. And Marceline is something that's really new and exciting here in China. This is a crossing between Cabernet Sauvignon and Grenache. So, you know, that's great for areas that are very dry and very sunny. And that's what Ningxia has. Ningxia is very dry and sunny, given that it's basically right next to the desert, right? So, you know, Marceline has a lot more potential than Cabernet Sauvignon, which seems to struggle a lot in China. So mostly dry red wine is what's being produced, and that's also being consumed by the population, and therefore that's what's being made. And what about the companies that are making this wine? Is it big companies that are government-owned that are behind the production, or are there small boutique players as well? Oh, I mean, that's actually something that I would say is different than other countries. You know, coming from Canada, for us, all the, the wine that's being produced typically come from really small producers, right? China, it's the complete opposite. When they started off making wine, it was only really from the government. So it was huge volume wine, insanely big. And so quality was always kind of at the back, right? Back of mind. Because when you're driven by more of a commercial aspect, we all know that quality sometimes might suffer. But there's two things happening. First is people are understanding the soil, they're understanding the how to manage their vineyards properly, and therefore quality is rising. And then the other thing is, as you've just mentioned, boutique producers. This is just starting, really, really just starting. And a lot of these boutique producers are, for, you know, Chinese citizens, I guess, that have moved to France or studied winemaking in France or even in Australia a lot came back from Adelaide University and are now starting their own vineyards and their own projects. So they're getting inspired by the quality from abroad and trying to bring that in back into China. And those are the exciting producers. These are people like Saoling Winery, of course, Canaan Winery, who came back from Germany. You have wineries like Domaine des Arômes, who lived in France. Those are the exciting producers that I think will be representing and waving the flag of Chinese wine production. You mentioned about the rise of wine enthusiasm. Do people sort of go and visit cellar doors and, and taste at wineries and do that kind of thing in China? One of the things is these areas are quite remote. So Ningxia, for example, is, oh, I'm forgetting now how long, but maybe four or five hours by flight. And then it's an hour or two away from the, from the actual airport. And it's in the middle of nowhere. There's no restaurants. It's not like, you know, when you go visit Yara and you have little restaurants or pockets of restaurants around and Melbourne's an hour away. It's not like that. This is really in remote, isolated areas. And I just made wine with uh, Xiaoling Estate in Yunnan. And they say that it's about an eight, uh, uh, sorry, a six hour drive from Shangri-La but it's actually more like a 12-hour drive. So you can just imagine, and this is from like going up and down, it's 3,000 meters altitude, so you can only imagine the amount of driving that's needed. So these areas tend to be really, really isolated for quality wine regions. And so it really attracts a very specific crowd, those who are probably more adventurous, but of course people who are in the trade who want to go see what's happening. But I don't see it attracting huge buses of tourism. And that's, that's an issue because, you know, we're trying to share quality wine producers with the rest of China. If they don't see it, you know, how do they know it's even happening, right? Because all they really get to see when you go to grocery stores is, of course, the big chain wines and the big wines that are being, that have the actual um, logistics to be sold throughout the country because China is so big. You do need such a big, you know, amount of wine produced to really be able to be national, I guess. So when you go into a Chinese wine retailer, what percentage of the wine that you would see in front of you would be locally produced? You know, that really depends on the, you know, where you're going. But I would say even at restaurants, less than 5%. So here's the thing. In China, Baidu, which is the white spirit, is actually what's being consumed, right? So the real local alcohol sales are still Baidu driven, and then they might have some wine to kind of showcase as an add-on. Wine bars themselves in Shanghai, or even wine restaurants or bistros, I would say I've only seen two, three examples or bottles on their wine list. And those are the ones that I would say win the best wine awards, right? The best uh, restaurant wine list awards only have two, three producers max on their wine list for Chinese wines. And the rest of it, they might have 
50 French wines, 20 Italians, right? 20 Australians. So you can just imagine that it's a really small number. One of the reasons is quality, consistency. You know, China, like I said, evolving wine industry, right? And it means that there's huge, for, for the most part, I've seen in my personal tasting experience, really big waves of quality when it comes to vintage variation. That's because everybody's doing this for the first time, right? And so everyone's trying to learn how to adapt with the soil, how to work with a different vintage, how to work with disease pressure and a different way of working. So that's, I think, the biggest issue is the consistency and then also the price. I mean, that's something I think we should maybe highlight. Chinese wines are not cheap. So they're not very competitive with some of the imported wines, perhaps, that are coming into China from, you know, South America, France, Australia, places like that. Right. And, you know, here in China, uh, New Zealand, Chile benefit from a uh, a tax-free environment for their wines. I think there was a, a duty a few years ago that actually approved that. And so, of course, Chile, if you're looking for price and quality in New Zealand, you know, they're, they're a lot better than the wines, the Chinese wines, if you're looking at the same quality ratio. So, for example, the, you can really, it's really swings, but those big government, let's say Chengyu, right? Great Wall, that's the name in English. That brand, for example, you might find around $10 Australian here. But most of the time, that's not what you actually see. Most of the time, the wines in China for a good value wine, a good Chinese quality wine and a good value is around 320 RMB. That's around $50 Australian is where you find good quality, good value. I mean, in Australia, I feel like if I get $20 to $25, I get great value. And so here, just to get a good value, I'm not saying it's the best quality. I'm just saying good value. You have to spend $50 on a bottle of Chinese wine. And that's just for entry level, right? If you're looking into quality, it's a minimum $300 Australian. So that's about 1,300 RMB. And that's, I'm talking about Aoyuan. Aoyuan is the project in Yunnan by... Um, LVMH, right? And that's going for three, almost 200 to $300 Australian. I don't know how much it markets back, back in Australia, but, you know, you can just imagine, I mean, that's what the price is going for. And I think first, people always underestimate that everything in China should be cheap, but it is very expensive to make wine in China. I guess one of the things is everything is imported into China. So the taxes and duties, that adds up. And then areas like Ningxia have to bury the vines every single year and then have to dig it back out. And that can only be done by hand. So imagine digging every single vine and trying to protect your vineyard. That's really a lot of work, a lot of costs associated. So Chinese wines first, um, I, mean, I, I think they're quite expensive. It's changing. It definitely is changing. I'm seeing better value wines come on the market. But of course, you know, any new winery is trying to recuperate their their loss, right? So that people are also trying to make money back from their investment. But, you know, as you know, wine takes a long time and most wineries don't even break even the first 10 years. So um, people are not as patient here when it comes to money as perhaps back home where, we're, you know, we're very aware that wineries take a long time to recuperate cost. What about the way that wine is marketed and sold in China? One trend we've really seen in recent years is the focus on terroir and really championing single vineyards and, and those types of things. And then obviously the, in France, they have the appellation system. In China, is there much focus on really telling the story of the particular site where the wine is from? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think there haven't been too many examples where terroir is really the key factor of a sales point out here. Um, some wineries, I know again, back to selling, they make individual, like six plots of specific vineyard lots. That's very rare. I've rarely heard wineries diving into vineyard sites, right? Making an exclusive vineyard site. And the way that they kind of market it is that it's Chinese wines and uh, more the story of the region and the unique features of the region. So right now, we're not even at the point where we can talk about soil. We're even trying to educate, and that's what the Chinese government is doing, especially for Ningxia, who's been heavily involved in trying to develop their region, is just letting people know that this region even exists, 
right? What they did, I think, a few years ago is they brought in, oh, I'm going to be wrong on my number, but 15 to 25 winemakers from around the world to come make wine for a year in Ningxia. So they're trying just to make people aware of that the region exists. They're not even at the point right now where soil is the top discussion. This episode of Drinks Adventures is supported by Fever Tree Premium Mixers, the mixer of choice in the world's best bars and restaurants. Right now, I'm enjoying Fever Tree's Mediterranean tonic for a more delicate touch on some of the fine Australian gins you've heard discussed on the show. The Chinese government has big ambitions for the potential of its wines. Is there a lot of investment going into the industry, though, and there must be a lot of new vines being planted just to, to try and sort of increase volumes over the next few years? Right. They're definitely, you know, as with any government around the world, they're definitely trying to promote their product. In terms of replanting, it is happening. There is actually quite a lot of wine on the market, which is hard to sell. And that's actually a problem that I've been seeing. It doesn't mean it's for everybody. But one of the things I've been noticing is, you know, the prices are so high. Um, yes, people can afford a $300 bottle. But the question is, if everybody, produ- you know, produces, you know, only 10000 $300 bottles, imagine how much wine is on the market at that high price, right? So there's also that assumption that somehow wine, if it's priced higher, will sell better. And then at the same time, if it's priced higher, you can make more money. But everybody's kind of done the same kind of strategy. And therefore, there's a little bit of a of a top heavy when it comes to expensive wine. So yeah, the government's definitely trying to promote, and that's through different types of activations in terms of uh, wine judging competitions or supporting wineries with uh, helping to finance or even trying to give them resources. But, you know, it's still at the beginning of the game. Um, So there's a lot of changes that are going to be happening in the next few years. I can foresee, hopefully, uh, if quality can improve, that would be the biggest step, right? Because you can do all the promotion you want, but at the end of the day, if quality is inconsistent, then that's where you're going to lose buyers. Is there much to speak of in the way of wine bars where Chinese people will come out and really get, you know, excited about drinking wines from all around the world? Oh, for sure. I mean, one of the things that really, I think, shocks a lot of the people when I bring them to China and show them around Shanghai is that the amount of really great bistros and natural wine bars, and that seems to be the thing right now in China is natural wine. Um, I mean, they're everywhere and they're popping up. And a bit like the beer and cocktail scene a few years ago, you know, China was really lagging. And now I think the cocktails that you find here in China are just as good as if you were back in Sydney. And I, you know, I really say that totally honestly, that if you did come out here, you'd be super shocked with how fast the country is moving. Now, having said that, China is really big, you know. So if you tell me that you go to a small city like Changsha, I can't assure you that you're going to find a good wine bar. But in the big cities like Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Shanghai, Beijing, I mean, Chengdu even, you are have no problem finding some great spots for wine. Hong Kong is a great example in its own right, you know, in terms of if you go to Hong Kong, the wine scene is really fantastic. And I think we're learning, people have traveled around the world now. People in China have gone to Hong Kong, they've gone to Singapore, they've gone to Japan and have been inspired to open their own shops out here. So they've seen the world. Um, It's not as close as it used to be. When it comes to natural wine, I think the reason is because it's really a point of differentiation amongst a very young and up and coming crowd, right? Whereas kind of the fine wine market is always gonna have its people. But what I've seen recently is that new generation, they're really excited to find something to differentiate themselves, right? And natural wine somehow speaks to that. It's against the rules. It's a little bit more fun and innovative. And it almost makes you in a little clique in a sense, right? So it's really interesting to see this develop. But definitely, I think China in terms of the wine scene is really developing rapidly in the wine bar scene, as well as in e-commerce. And e-commerce is making everybody around China accessible to great wines from importers from around the country. And that's exciting is e-commerce as well. Now let's talk about your podcast, Emily. Um, Bottled in China, what led you to launch the podcast? Originally, it's because I was a bit frustrated with the lack of knowledge um, of people out of China. And and that's completely understandable. I mean, I don't expect anyone to really understand uh, what was happening in the drink and food scene. But 
I recall I was doing some presentations for the Canadian government back home, talking about how to enter China and all these things. That was years ago. And people just had such a different idea of China. And so I felt, well, I wish I could explain it to people and, and firsthand experience people have worked in the market like Ian, who have had the chance to interview as well, or other people in the food and wine industry share their stories. And one of the reasons is, for me, Shanghai feels a bit like New York 20, 30 years ago. You know, that kind of like Wild West and the idea that everything is possible. And I wanted to capture these moments and these innovative, young, talented people in the market who moved from their country to come here and start a restaurant or Chinese locals who moved abroad or got inspired by something and, and wanted to change the scene. So, you know, that's through the podcast that I really get to share the experiences and stories of really fascinating individuals. And actually in 2020, that changed a bit from only being China focused to a little bit more of a global aspect, um, just given that I thought there was more voices around the world that I wanted to share. What are some of your favorite episodes that people should look out for? Right. Well, I mean, you know, we, we cover food and beverage. I would say a lot of it somehow always winds up as wine. And I don't know why. <laughs> I think you do a great job where you balance everything out. And I don't know if it's because I'm more focused in wine that somehow I get to meet so many people. I'm like, oh, I would love to talk to you about more about what you're doing in wine. I guess that's one of the reasons. But I, tr you know, I, I try. I think try is a very loose term here because if you look back at a lot of the podcasts, they dabble into alternative protein and food, beer, sake. But I would say 60% is probably wine. So, I mean, my favorite episodes, that's really hard to, to highlight, but it really depends what you're looking for. You know, people probably listening to this podcast. Um, if you want to learn more about Chinese wine, I did a podcast a few I want to say a few months ago with Christelle from Siga Estate in Ningxia. That was a two-part episode where we dive into Chinese wine, Chinese wine production, why Chinese wines are expensive. So I kind of answer those questions um, and Christelle answers them in that podcast. And that's really fascinating because she really breaks it down. She even talks about yields and how low of the yields we have in China, which contribute to cost. And then, of course, things, you know, the future of food I mean, I, I learned so much from the podcast. I think, James, just like you, talking to people, you get to learn an a entirely new world, one that just opens up, right? When we talk about sake, China e-commerce, how to make a great website, SEO. Those are more global topics. And even bottled cocktails, you know, the rise of bottled cocktails um, with Liba, which really started to soar during COVID and the idea that you can't go to grab a great craft cocktail um, by a mixologist that it was all brought home. So, so many different podcasts. I think mine tend to be a little bit on the business side. I don't know why. I think I may be boring, but I, I really do love those more business topics. So somehow that's kind of how they end up, but definitely um, a little bit of everything for everybody. Well, that's fantastic, Emily. And where can people find Bottle in China? Right. So Bottle in China is across any of the podcasts that you might listen to, iTunes, um, of course, Google Podcasts as well, Spotify. And uh, you can just connect with me on Instagram. That's usually the best spot or LinkedIn as well. LinkedIn, you can find me at Emily Steckenborn. Mind you, my last name is really complicated, so I won't be sharing how to spell that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but those are the best ways. Instagram at Bottled in China and then on my LinkedIn at uh, Emily Steckenborn if you wanted to connect further. But yeah, what a pleasure, James. Thanks so much for joining me on the show. Of course. Cheers. The Drinks Adventures podcast is produced by me, James Atkinson, with additional production and mixing by Dave Robertson. You can find complete transcripts, links, and other information on the show at drinksadventures.com.au. You can follow me on all social media platforms at by James Atkinson, like my Facebook page, James Atkinson Drinks Adventures, to be kept informed of podcast giveaways and other news about the show. The Drinks Adventures podcast needs your support as listeners. Please do us a favour and leave an honest review and rating for the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. We love hearing your feedback and it helps inform other people this is a show worth listening to. Or simply drop us a line at hello at drinksadventures.com.au.